Okay, thank you very much for your coming to the talk. Actually, I'd like to introduce my friend. I worked for NFTB in Japan. He was a kind of junior in my lab. And uh, we published one paper at ICRA in 2014. Mm. Actually, I didn't know about my, you know, <laughs> ID and the global war. And it seems like I get back to the, you know, collaboration <laughs> with the guys. And I have an intern from Taylor University. And uh, he's working on a, actually, my robotics with human interaction using a speed technology for a long time. And now, you know, Razan is the model is very popular. I'm really looking for this whole to cover all areas. So thank you, Zona. Thank you, Chiyori san Hi, uh, thank you for joining. A, I'm Kome Segura from Cambridge University. A, actually, I was an internship student years ago. So I'm very glad to come back here to give a talk. Yeah, I was, yeah, also sitting like you 20 years ago. So um, today I'm gonna to talk about a, the conference of vision, language and robotics. And they, of course, many of you might know the a very famous Fermi robot. So let me show some videos of use cases. So, in this case, so the robot is given an instruction, bring me the rice chips from the drawer, and then the robot decompose the instruction into atomic tasks, and then a go to the drawer, a open the drawer, a try to rust it, and they there might be sometimes a adversarial a action by humans, but still robot try to a do the appropriate action. So in this case, the action is a um, predicted three parts. And this is an example of indoor robot. And they, the other one is joint research object is of personal mobility, a, which understands human instructions. So a, for example, um, this user calls a robot by using smartphone, then ask the robot to a, go to somewhere uh, by speech. So for example, I, a, let me bring to the, uh, uh, yeah, he's, he says a, arrived at the burger store. And then the personal mobility a, combines the information from vision and language. And a, then the user asks the robot to go to the, uh, go next to the vending machine. And then again, a, the robot tried to understand the format a, by a, combining the information from vision and language. So actually, this technology a, has a drastic change a, in this a, recently a, by, a, for example, large language models a, and a high-performance neural networks. So um, most of them a, are enabled by, let's say, foundation models. And they, as you might know, the definition of foundation models are not very strict. So it says in the paper, it says the model is trained on broad data as well and adaptable to a wide range of downstream tasks. And for example, BERT, GPT-3, and FLIPS are typical foundation models. And a, this, a talk, in this talk, um, I'm going to introduce some of the a work a, about the impact of foundation models to robotics. And there are many a, examples about the impact of foundation models to robotics. A, but actually, it's, there are less a, you know, work for the impact of robotics a, to foundation models. So the good thing about foundation, using foundation models in robotics is that it's robust to unseen situations. And a, 10 years ago, 
actually, let's say we are building the ro communicative robots. Of course, you have to have a spe speech specialist or language specialist to you know have kind of a very complicated dialogue. But today, actually, it's easily easily usable for non-experts, and that's why a, there are many many applications in robotics these days. And unfortunately, there are still um, little impact to of robotics to foundation models. But I hope a, for example, Joyce and does the you know um, communicative self drawing parts, and maybe car can collect data. And if there are, um, you know, many users, you know, there can be many data uh, which can be used for training the model. And also um, there are a example cases about automated experiment, experiments, a, you know, such as biological experiments or chemical experiments using robots. So uh, let me start with the example of foundation model usage in speech and language. So first of all, um, these are like a use cases about text embedding. A so many robotics, a robotics use a you know Bert Robota developer these days, and a, recently I like I prefer use. To use a the open AI's embedding a, because sometimes it has you know improvement and they of course um you know um Jory and I a worked on um speech interface for robots a 10 years ago and I they published a service called Rospeaks a which was used by during the uh, um, to 2019. So this is um, 10 years ago, um, but still, so it, it's okay. So we have a smartphone interface, and they, you know, the speech interface is you know, sounds like very conversational. And also, it was uh, multilingual uh, because NICT provides multilingual a speech recognition server. And uh, what I realized um, from the experience of building such kind of cloud based a robot communication platform is that most robot developers prefer not to, you know, operate the speech recognition servers by themselves, they would like to focus on, you know, the hardware part, a electricity, a mechatronics, and they, they prefer a, to, a, to use the cloud-based system. And, you know, using smartphone UI is good because, you know, sometimes we talk to the robot from very, very far away, but with the smartphone, the, you know, noisy speech, can be a appropriately recognized. So the next thing is also the lightweight uh, usage for a uh, large language models for in robotics. And a, the first one is called as policies, a, in which LLM generates atomic action, sequence of atomic actions. So for example, a detect object or something like that. And this is one way a generation, but in the chat GPT for robotics, a humans can give feedback to LLMs. And then the code is interactively generated. The third one is tidy bot, a which recognize target objects by clip and generates code. Um, including the receptacle uh, destination of the object a, by LNN. Actually, this looks good. And this is also, a, it's gonna be presented in IROS a, next week.
But this approach actually has some limitations, a, not about tidy bot, but the uh, former two uh, approaches a, have some issues. A, that is the situation information should be hand coded to the prompt. So, you know, let's say there is yellow shirt, there is blue shirt, there is a speaker or something like that. These should be put into the prompt, which is a little bit, you know, uh, labor intensive. But the third approach use a clip. So it's a kind of an open vocabulary. So it does not need kind of this kind of situation information. Actually, but the tidy bot does not have some any you know speech interface. It just try to find the object nearby and put it into the destination. So um, in the next slide, I'd like to explain a little bit about the clip, and then I'll try to explain about the application of clip in robotics. So many of you might know about clip, a which is trained on 400 million a image text pairs, and it um, changed robotics, you know, a lot. So the point is that a if the train set a concept of a pair of a pairs of the text and image, and the image encoder encodes it into some features, and the feature should be trained to have a you know, strong similarity in a um, contrastive training a scheme. Uh, which is done by a uh, info NC Ross and a in case you would like to prefer the optimal transport a there is a method called Otter which uses a optimal transport but anyway a clip is hand very handy so many robotics use clip these are some of the examples a the first one is Freeport, a which is which was a proposed in um, 2021, and it has a um, transporter network which output the um, a heat map of the position where to a put the um, gripper. So, for example, in this case, the gripper to put uh, you know to be here to grasp the test a chest what chest stone or something like that. And by doing a this, it can you know um unfold the towel or fold the towel. So this thing is a enabled by a clipboard. And um, there's a 60 version of clipboard which is called product a which was proposed in proposed at call 2022 by the same author. And um, kite a is the a a little bit a a similar a version of uh, fold the cloth in half and a product. It predicts which part of the object a two glass. So, for example, in case unfold the cloth scissors, a the gripper should grasp the handle. Put the orange block on the blue block. And there are um, other approaches. Put the red blocks in the or green bowl. Flat, a, for object search, the first one is a, using flat for a navigation. And the other one is open scene, a, which was proposed in a published in CBT. Pack the white this tape year. in the brown box. So this is. This is the um, open scene. A, Pack the so scissors in the brown box. Given the uh, point cloud and the uh, images, the each point cloud. Pack the spoon in the brown box. It, with the um, image feature. So for example, it can find. Pack the red object, whiteboard marker in the brown box. Object, it will solve for where to sit. These things are in a. Pack the blue whiteboard marker in the brown scene. box.
And when the uh, people uh, use club <clears throat> or robot, robots, there are major approaches. One is A, one is a one as a 1D feature vector uh, because this is easy. So just one line of code is enough. So model encode image, very easy. But the problem is that the positional information is lost. But what the robot, um, for example, mobile manipulation robot should do is, for example, grasp the object on the desk or something like that. So in this case, this approach has some limitations. So additional information is sometimes the object detection, but still many people use closed vocabulary object detector. So it has some limitations. Another approach is using 2D feature map a, in which a, the intermediate output from resident VIT a, is extracted. So for example, 20 by 28 by 28 a, or 14 by 14. And typical work include Freeport and Chris, a, which is a segmentation work and a side adapter network. So in this case, the um, image encoder is freeze and the intermediate output is extracted. And these are some of the multimodal LLMs a, applied to a robotics. The first one is a late fusion version, a, for example, Palm Seiken, a proposed by Google, and it consists of two scores. One is language score, and the other is a action score, say and can. And for the say score, a, it's an estimated generation probability of phrases. So LLM, LLM a generate possible phrases, a grasp object, a wipe the desk, of the thing. So many, many phrases are a, generated and the generation probability is accompanied uh, like this. So place the, the apple or something like that. Then the um, value function a, estimate the task success probability. So for example, in this case, find an apple has the success rate of 0 0.6. This is trained on uh, trained beforehand. And combining these two scores, the Saken system a make decision which of the phrase the robot should a execute. This is a typical late fusion approach. And the um, the other one is early fusion approach. A for example, Parmi a has um, image in the import. So the prompt like is something like given image. Image part is the um, vector representation, and then the question part it comes up next. So in the prompt. Um, it has a multimodal a import. And a, last week, this week, a OpenAI also a published no, a report that a, they will publish a GPT-4 vision V. So I guess they have some similar approach, a audio fusion approach. And there are also a, some attempts to build a foundation model uh, for robotics. The famous one is RT1, a, a published last year. And uh, it has um, many, many authors actually. A, it constructs a data set from 13 physical robots and it spent a 17 months to collect the training data. 
in RT1, actually, the image text fusion is a little bit um, classic uh, approach, a, but in RT2, a, it uses multimodal LLM. Actually, they try two LLM, LLMs to predict a 6D velocity. So the difference of the position and difference of orientation. And Gato um, is a published in 2022 by a DeepMind, a, which tried to um, develop a single transformer to learn game, image captioning, object manipulation, and so on. These are um, some, of, some of the a robotic foundation models. And I'd like to introduce some of the benchmarks for vision, language, and robots, a, for vision, language, and robots. And the first one is RoboCamp at home, uh, which is the largest benchmark test for domestic service robots, a, which start in, started in 2006. And the other one is home robots, a, which will start this year at NeurIPS, and this is a kind of open vocabulary mobile manipulation challenge. And they currently the simulation phase is um, conducted, and then the top N teams go to the physical benchmarking tests. So this is a simulator version, and they you see a physical robot version later here okay let me introduce a robocop at home is a little bit more. happening so really in the wild world actually going shopping is the task which is a nice task so actually, the robot first of all has to build up a map because the environment is unknown one guy will introduce real, several objects real, um, to the robot I mean. so he will be saying something like yeah this is the mill this, or, is, this is the pringles the or something like that memorize the, the pepsi real yeah can you confirm that should i memorize the pepsi Yes! With pleasure. The robot has to remember the so, position of the object. Actually, you At the checkout, um, the referee will the say, um, yeah, I want to I buy like three objects. As, uh, Fetch me the Pepsi. So I, I okay. say, don't really know which objects, but some of the objects that are in an official list. And, and then the robot has to autonomously to go to the positions, find the objects, grasp the objects from the shelf, and, and bring them back to the to the checkout. It was too difficult. So 2010, almost no teams get zero score. But um, recently, um, this year, uh, almost uh, this task is almost solved by foundation models. And also we won first places a 10 years ago. Why we were not able to solve that task 10 years ago? Actually, a, it consists of the um, linguistic instruction. So go get some juice from refrigerator. And then a, the first thing is a, to understand the speech part in noisy environment. The, um, background noise level is sometimes 80 dBA, very noisy because of announcement. And average, on average, it's 65 to 70 dBA. So the speech recognition was difficult, then understanding was difficult. And at that moment, the, you know, tasks are, you know, not we did not have a packaged atomic actions. So we hand coded all of the actions. So it's really hard to decompose and put it into the sequence. Yeah, that's why. And how about object recognition? Yeah, that's true. Um, at that moment, object recognition was um, maybe the first version of Yolo or something. So it was a not very good and not open vocabulary, a 
yeah, yeah. and also then um object orientation a prediction was not very correct so now 100 percent the system can achieve means that speech um, like 100 percent let, let's say not 100 percent uh, currently it's about a 40 to 50 percent past sex array this means almost 99 percent a language comprehension is okay but the navigation a object detection and the grafting these things are sometimes difficult so let's say 80 percent a navigation 80 percent object detection and 80 percent grafting times like you know 40 percent of the other and still we have a problem to solve yeah but the most difficult part was the decomposition of a task and a put it together into a sequence mm -hmm. this can be done by some part of what is going to be done by it uh, so means that the goal is uh needs to be uh combined in the micro steps atomic mm -hmm. action mm -hmm. sequence that part is the most was was more difficult but not anymore not anymore. so okay. but still there are a many more problems i will talk about a later in this talk so um of course you know foundation model did not solve all of the problems for example this is some of the challenging examples a about referring this question comprehension and uh, i tried google bar a in july and uh, in the left for the left sample it recognized this pillow as white pillow and for this right image uh i also tried seam a segment everything anywhere a everywhere model and they it masked um the mirror the green part instead of the plant uh given pick up the plant in front of the mirror so referring expression comprehension is still difficult um of course you know draw opening or something else these are difficult but for the language multimodal a language understanding this program still remains so i i'm going to talk about a little bit about our work about referring expression a comprehension and other work about domestic service robots and let me start with the motivation and um the motivation is the use um potential use uh user is wheelchair users and the social issue includes that a for some countries there is decrease in the working age but the there is an increase of the people who need support but training so these um people who need assist are currently supported by family professional um supporter or assistance dogs but training and assistance dog sometimes needs very long time two years and a um 20k us dollar so um i'm trying to build domestic service robot um which can support a these people in in this video is a published by toyota and this robot is hsr a, which i i'm using and um in this case it used uh, the user uses um uh, pointy pen to specify the object in this case water but you know in a typical house there are many objects sometimes it can be 5000 objects so in this case it's really hard to select by hand but using a language has some also challenging issues and another aspect is about um what should be done and to what extent a uh, we should do and this is intentional i analyzed 108 service doc tasks assistance doc tasks 
defined by IAADP, International Association of Assistance Dog Partners. And out of 108 subtasks, 50 tasks can be doable by HSR. So my point is that a, if we categorize them into you know, several tasks, such as carry tasks, op open close tasks, soft, ob ob a soft object manipulation tasks, we can define the metric, such as task coverage and task success rate. So for example, a, we can set as 80%, 90%, and a recently, uh, we focus on these tasks such as carry and retrieve and follow tasks using language. And let me show the demonstration, uh, which is open vocabulary mon mobile manipulation. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry. Oops. So the instruction is, can you fetch the baseball near the red mark cup and place it on the tall table? And the uh, system uh, returns a search result. I will explain uh, the method later. And uh, I also use a uh, segment anything model sound for object detection and a grasping point projection. And uh, then the robot uh, detects object a glass bed and go to the destination receptacle and put it on the tall table. And second instruction is take the tomato soup can and then a robot uh, try to find the target. So important point is that this is kind of a multimodal search system and I will explain why in the next slide. And here um, you can see the a collision projection system as well. So I will explain it later as well. And why I'm using the um, multimodal a search setting is that free autonomous approach is actually, you know, doesn't do not always succeed. For example, in the reverie task a proposed in 2020 in CDPR, the language comprehension accuracy is only 30%. So which means task rate success rate is lower than 30%. And also there are many, many closed vocabulary approach, a you know until recently, but these were um, not practical. So in this setup, I use the open vocabulary setup. And approach is human in the loop approach and machine generates the search results like search engine. And then the user select preferable option among them. And by using this setup, um, this is actually very, you know, typical approach in speech <laughs> system, but not very popular in robotics actually. It, by this setup, um, I would say the uh, success rate is going to be much, much higher. So this is mean reciprocal rank. So this is rank uh, one divided by rank, which means 0 0.5 means on average, the um, ground truth, uh, sorry, ground truth is predicted a better than the second place. If the average is the second, the MRR becomes 0 0.5. So yeah, it looks good with the, um, you know, physical search approach because the autom fully autonomous approach is lower than 30%. And these are um, some of the qualitative A results uh, in the, uh, on the reverie data set. And the first one, uh, in the first one, the instruction is go to the bathroom with a picture of a wagon and bring me the towel. 
directory across from the sink. And these are search results. And the first one is correct. A second one and third one are correct. And the fourth one through the sixth one is a incorrect. But um, anyway, uh, the data set has three correct samples. So it's OK. And the second one is a very long sentence, a go to the hallway, blah, 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 and a the high chair closest to the wine bottle. Actually, every data set has very long sentences. The a pop standard data set, GREF, a the average length is 8.8 .8 words, but in Revery, it, it is like uh, 18. So than 2.5 times a longer than a GREF. And this example is super difficult because there are many wine bottles here, but wine bottles here. And the second table from the door is actually this is correct, but it's really hard to find a, this is a door, this is first table, this is a second table. And this is also second table. And here you can see a little bit door. And our approach, a successfully a searched um, the correct examples. And there are, these are some of the a standard a simulators and data sets. A, in the real world, uh, we recently used um, Reverie data set, uh, which a, is kind of uh, constructed over room to room data set. Room to room data set is the first large scale data set a, and also standard data set a, collected in the um, 90 houses uh, with 3D point cloud and a, the segmentation. And in the library data set, a annotator gives the uh, um, instruction to find an object. In this case, here you can see facet. And uh, the task is following the path uh, to the uh, faucet. And the right one is um, simulation environment. A, the right one is Alfred a, and also uh, home robot. And we are in bench is the typical simulation data set. And the good thing is that you can change illumination condition, you can randomly a uh, distribute objects, a uh, you can collect data set with very low cost. These are good thing about simulation, but good thing about real world data set is that um, you can you know a uh, transfer the knowledge to real world. Actually, the former demonstration video is a zero shot a model trained on Reverie data set, which works good. But for simulation data set, the zero shot a performance is not so good compared to the real world data set. So you mean that the simulation data set doesn't work the real data set, real world? Real world data set is better. But you, you should have a transfer learning approach. A, if you would like to use, you, you would like to apply zero shot a more learning from the simulation to real world. So people believe that, you know, if we train the model using simulation data, tons of simulation data, actually you, we can model the real world. I, I have something to say. Actually, I have some, you know, simulators and they, I check the um, object recognition accuracy, a, depending on the photorealisticness and a, some of the Unity-based photo, very, very photorealistic simulator, the zero shot performance is actually good. But for the Alfred data set, this is not good. And of course, there are, you know, more low quality simulation like gazebo, the zero shot performance is poor, very poor. 
Okay, and Mar is working on that the motherboard status. Okay, okay. So you yeah. use this one. This one is motherboard. Motherboard, yeah. So you mean that motherboard data doesn't work for the real world? Mo motherboard data set is good. Sure. So Reverie yeah. is a built upon motherboard 3D. I mean that at least I believe that motherboard is the uh, real estate. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And uh, real house yeah. in, in a home is kept. Yeah. Okay, so then I'm gonna uh, explain a little bit about the some of the approaches. A and the first one is a vision language navigation model, a which is called cross map transformer, uh, proposed in 2021. And what I did is a this is a kind of a um, masking approach of three modality. The novelty is a introducing the task masking model. A as well as language masking and you know image masking, and also um, the another uh, novelty is that uh, it introduces double mounting model back translation for a data augmentation, and maybe speech people uh, or machine translation people uh, know that data augmentation or data augmentation is possible uh, with back translation a approach. But actually, in robotics, back translation was not popular. So what I a thought is that you know the data augmentation by back translation for machine translation is something like you have English sentence and translate into German sentence and translate back to English. And if it's the same, you can put in the a training set. This this is back translation. This very classical approach. And multimodal approach is something like this. You have interaction plus the image. So you translate into path sequence and then translate back to the interaction and image. And if it's the same, and also start from path to interaction plus image to end back to path, we can put it in the training set. This is double box translation. Well, we a, proposed this approach and they took soda at that moment, a, which is success rate of 73%, but now there are many better approaches. And a, because Chiori san does some of the, you know, um, communicative self-driving car, I thought this a work as well. And the task is vision language navigation for out of the in out of the situation. So for example, um, the instruction is, Follow in behind the blue band on the left side, and the task is to predict this area. So, do you remember in the first slide I showed the personal mobility of Honda? A this is joint work with Honda, a and to predict the target region based on landmark. So, in panoptic segmentation approach, stuff is kind of a region. And the thing is a specific object. So the difficulty is that we need these two things in this setup. And um, the novelty lies here is that because this has stuff, this needs stuff and a thing information, we introduce additional uh, modality. Uh, which is segmentation modality, and also actually the segmentation sometimes um, deteriorate a little um, very much. So we introduce the day-night classification branch to estimate the mask quality. So let me show you the you know mask deterioration. So this is a day example, and you can see the semantic segmentation works pretty well. And with the same data set, it has night images. And the segmentation in performance is really poor. So, you know, if we put these things all together, sometimes the model try to over um, trust the segmentation modality. So we put uh, additional a module. 
to balance the uh, modalities. And these are some of the qualitative results. A, so in this case, pull up behind the guy wearing the white shirt and GT is this region and baseline predicts here and ours predicts here. So white shirt, wearing a white shirt. So here, this guy is wearing white shirt, which is really difficult. Can you show that these link lesion uh, and the figure, the lesion, these link? Um, actually, this is kind of um, a referring expression, a segmentation model. So the model itself is similar to LABT, a, which is proposed in 2022, I think. So the reasoning is inside the um, model. Yeah, not, uh, can we visualize the reasoning? Um, the reason why we select that region because of that we can recognize twice. Okay, okay. Actually, a, these things are um, put into the model inside. So there is no, you know, um, I would say a independent module for reasoning. It's really hard. Yeah, we can discuss it later. Okay. So these are outdoor robots. And a, this is a, a, some of the indoor robot case. A, so let me introduce a little bit about the work. We will make presentation in IROS next week. The first one is a understanding multiple referring expressions. A, so for example, in the carry test, the instruction is carry A from B to C. And the issue is it has combinatorial explosion. So let's say in the house, the potential object is sometimes 5,000 or 10,000 and destination, potential destination will be, I don't know, 200 or 1,000. So if the number of objects is, you know, let's say 200, and the destination, we have 30 destinations, uh, which is a small number. A, in this case, still uh, the decision will take 30 seconds, which is impractical. So we made a single model to solve uh, this multiple a defining expression comprehension. So in this case, the command is put the red chip scan on the white table with a soccer ball on it. And in the demonstration, you saw that the, you know, um, decision making was really fast. So even in the setup, uh, our approach works. And task success rate is almost ninety percent. And these are uh, some of the, you know, the uh, transfer learning a approach for the simulation data set. So we also have the, um, we are going also would like to a, solve the um, simulation to real uh, problem. And in this a setup, uh, we a, propose the prototypical constructive learning approach. And the right one is a segmentation model, which uses a diffusion segmentation model. So yeah, these are short display interactions. And finally, I will a little bit explain about the generation part of robot. And we also um, construct a photorealistic simulation. And the good thing is that a sometimes five years ago, I asked annotators to give the annotation of the image collected from simulator and it takes a lot. Today, we can collect more than 10 million labeled images within a day. And in this case, a 
so this um, robot um, is a object manipulation a robot a and it try to find a place to uh, sorry the position to place objects and I will explain later but a in this setup um, it uses a XAI approach to find a place a safe a region to place objects so here you can see heat map and they say placeable which means there is not going to be a collision and the point uh, about this a prediction a collision prediction is that a if you are using hardware robot you might know they are very fragile sometimes it crash into the desk and last year one of the my one of my student a you know use the the hardware robot and press into the desk and it took like one month for repairing the robot so it stopped the experiment so it's a you know very uh, critical issue for roboticists not to you know break the robot so the collision prediction is a uh, you know central issue in robotics and the good thing is that previously uh, this collision avoidance is done by hand coded a potential approach but using simulation we can collect successful placement motion and failure motions and we collect a lot of um, data like that and then we train the model and here um we use the um, attention branch network uh, proposed in 2019. It is kind of an explainable AI approach, a, which a, uses, let's say we have a ResNet, very simple ResNet. It has speech extractor part and perception part and plus it predicts plus level. And attention branch network first separate these two and put the feature map uh, to into the attention branch to predict class level as well. And this attention heat map becomes um try to uh, focus on very important part in the image. So we use this a feature map, um sorry, attention map a for um visualizing the collision a risk. And then this is a Motonari's work. And after the um, risk visualization, a, we tried the language generation part. So for example, in this case, before the robot, uh, before the motion recognition, robot can say the robot might hit the hourglass should we cancel the motion and then human can abort the motion but only with the uh, risk visualization sometimes it's hard to uh, understand so we um, developed the language generation method so these are qualitative uh, results in this case reference is a robot hits the camera from above because the robot tried to put the white bottle where it is. And the, the baseline a generates a little bit dif different thing, but um, a black teapot, but a, our system a generates the uh, explanation a, appropriately. So this is the cooking video uh, future captioning. A yeah, it, it, anyway, it works good. And then finally, I'll explain a little bit about um, evaluation metrics. So um, building automatic evaluation metric is also essential for development of the image captioning models. But actually, 
the current metric is has very low uh, correlation with human evaluation. So it's really weird to you know um, compare the method using such kind of uh, poor um, performance metric. So how poor they are is that so for example in blue it has 0 0.29 with the human evaluation which is very low and a, I actually a, um, collect a many human judgment data set a, about um, more than 20k and uh, the human human a correlation is about 0 0.75 and our approach has 0 0.5. So there are still room for improvement. But anyway, these metrics are very poor. So we made a graph matching based um, metric. And this is kind of ongoing work. Okay, so finally, I would like to sum up the uh, talk. Uh, today, I talked about the, the themes and finally, I'd like to a uh, thank the um a SP and NATO and um my collaborators, students and staffs. Thank you very much.